If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. What a great way to prepare us for our message this morning. I worship. We're in week two of a five-week series entitled I Series, where we're talking about and answering the question, what am I to do? What am I supposed to do? If you remember, this is not a series that is primarily what do I believe. We've done series like that before, and they're important. What we believe about the Word of God. But that's not what this series is about. We've done series before at Who Am I in Christ and talked about how we are saved and and believers and, and the benefits and the blessings that God gives us through that. That's not primarily what this series is about either. The I series is about answering the question, what am I to do? What do I do as a Christian? Last week we looked at discipleship when we talked about I disciple. As a Christian, I'm going to disciple others. And if you haven't had a chance to hear that message, I would invite for you to go to our website and and look into listening to that message from last week at the importance of discipleship and pouring into the lives of other people. But this morning, I'm going to look at what a lot of Christians would define as the pinnacle action of Christianity. I'm not 100% sure that that's entirely accurate, but it's certainly up there as, as one of the primary actions that we do as believers, and that is worship. This morning's message is, I worship. Has there ever been something that you really, really wanted? I mean, not just it'd be nice to have, but almost lusted after. You had to have it. You wanted it above all else. Even if you knew it was out of your reach, or maybe you knew it wasn't good for you, or maybe you knew it wasn't even something that, that it was attainable, but you wanted it. When we lived in Kentucky, um, there were two weekends in a row that, that Hannah was uh, gone out of town visiting family and doing different things. And uh, it happened to be nights that there were home football games in town. So I went out with a few guys and we went and got uh, uh, Mexican food for dinner and then went to the football game. And at the football game, they had funnel cakes. And so they had all sorts of fried stuff. Did you know you can deep fry an Oreo? We used to eat those too. They're pretty good. Deep fried uh, Twinkies and things like that. I thought I'm going to be mild. I'll just have a deep fried dough, you know, just a funnel cake. Well, the combination of Mexican food and funnel cake, while very delicious, does not do real well on your stomach. And I was up all night with horrible acid, sick the entire night, this first Friday night. Well, the next week, Hannah's gone again. There's another home football game. And so what do we do? We get a couple of guys together. Why don't we meet up and get some Mexican food? And we go down, get some Mexican food. And we go to the game. And there's the temptation, the deep fried funnel cake. And I really, really, really wanted a funnel cake. Now I'm thinking back, okay, I know what happened to me last week, but you know, I took medicine tonight, I took some Zantac, I'm prepared, I can pop a couple of Tums, I'm going to be okay. And, and it was something that the, the urge and the desire was so strong. I had to fight. Do I eat the funnel cake and know what the consequences are? Do I push it aside? And, and I have to tell you, I have zero willpower when it comes to food. And so I was up all night, again, sick to my stomach from eating another funnel cake after a rich Mexican meal. Have you ever wanted something so bad you had to have it? It didn't matter what the consequences were. It didn't matter what it cost you. It didn't matter what the circumstances may be. You had to have it. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's a car, maybe it's a house, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a, an education or a degree, maybe it's a, another person, whatever it would be. We've all had things that we, we have to have. There's nothing that keeps us from attaining it. This morning, I want to think for a moment about that picture of yearning and longing and desiring. This idea that, that we must have something and apply it to this morning's message, I worship. Because we lust after so many things. And they are just that, they are things. We have to have a better paying job. We have to have a bigger house. Or we have to have a certain car. We have to have a certain status quo. We have to have a certain reputation. We really, really want those things. We have to have this person in our life. We have to have whatever it may be. And when we have to have something, there is nothing that will keep us from it. It doesn't matter if it makes us sick. 
It doesn't matter if it costs us in the short term or even if it costs us in the long term. It's something that nothing will separate us from. And it's in that picture I want us to think of our worship of God. I want us to think of a desire, not just a a convenience, but a yearning and a desire to know God, to have a relationship with God in such a way that there is nothing that would keep us from pursuing Him. Everything else fades away. It may cost us friends and relationships. It may cost us reputation and status quo. It may cost us even financially. It may cost us physically. It may cost some people around the world in their desperation for Christ. It may cost their very lives. When we think of worship this morning, it is is much more than simply singing a few songs gathering together and hearing a few words, it is this full pursuit, this full desire to know who God is. This morning in John chapter 4, we see a, a picture that is painted of false worship that is turned into genuine worship. And that's the path I want us to go on this morning. Not that we've worshipped falsely or we've had fake worship at our church we've had a a wonderful worship set and it's part of worship we have genuine worship here but for many people worship is a convenience it's not a craving it's something that we do out of obligation it's not something that we pursue because it's how we're wired and who we are and this morning in john chapter 4 jesus is talking to a woman a woman with a very poor reputation And he finds her drawing water out of a well in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day. And he approaches her and talks to her about her situation. He asks her a few questions and it leads up to a question about her husband. And she says to him, I have no husband. To which he replies, I know you don't have a husband. And the man you're living with is not your husband. And you've had plenty of husbands before. She goes, how does this man know this? He knows everything about me. I've never met this man before in my life. Here I am, this outcast woman drawing in the middle of the heat of the day because I'm trying to avoid people. This strange man approaches me and he knows me inside and out. And she begins to ask him questions about worship. We see her initial reaction is one that is is not as genuine as we might think but eventually becomes this yearning and this craving and this genuine worship of Christ. Let's pick up in John chapter 4, verse 19. After Jesus has called her out and explained that he knows everything about her, he tells her starting in verse 19, or she responds to him in verse 19, Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, yet you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, you will worship neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, it is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. I am he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. We see a progression in this woman's life of of wanting to know information about worship and leading to a revelation of who Christ is and why he is worthy of worship. She begins simply with a question trying to change the subject. Okay, Jesus, you know everything about me. You know about my past. You know about my sins. You know about my struggles. Let's just talk about some, something that can take our mind off of this. It's equivalent to bringing up the weather or politics or something with a friend. Just trying to spark a conversation. 
So she moves on and she says, I am a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan people say, this mountain right here, right where you're on, is where we worship God. But you Jews, all those other people, say we worship somewhere else. She asks about worship. This morning, as we look at Jesus' response and how we are to worship, what we're called to do in worship, we have to clarify different types of worship. Typically, we think of two different ways of worshiping. Most of the time, what comes to mind when we talk about worship is we talk about a service. You are here this morning at a worship service. It's printed on some of our material. Worship time is at 1030. We have a a worship uh, atmosphere. We're gathered together, and that is what we refer to as corporate worship, where we are gathered together with other believers in our worship. But there's another aspect to worship that many of us either miss or neglect. And that is worship that does not include sitting next to someone who you sit next to every week. It does not include being around the same group of people all the time. Sometimes it's private, it's personal, it's just one-on-one. And it is more of a personal worship. It's just our daily living with a worshipful attitude. And any time you read scripture, you can apply principles on worship to both settings. Corporate worship, where we're gathered together. And personal worship on a Tuesday afternoon when it's just you and God. When it's just you and your co-workers. When it's just by yourself. So as we look at worship this morning, we have to realize it is more than what is contained in these four walls where we're sitting. Worship explodes out of here. The majority of time, worship is done in these intimate settings. We like to lump it into an hour on Sunday morning. Maybe a a short brief time on Wednesday nights. Maybe some discipleship time throughout the week. But worship is more than just formal corporate settings. It is meant to be applied on a personal level. So what does genuine worship look like? How do we go from just showing up and singing songs and doing what we always do to craving and yearning and longing for relationship with Christ? Well, for starters, we have to understand worship recognizes Jesus. It knows who he is. There is no worship if there is no Jesus. There is no biblical worship if you remove the object of worship. Whatever we long for, whatever we push for, whatever we desire for, there's there's something that we want. And when you remove that want and that desire, our worship fades. Worship has to see who Jesus is. And it's not just the name Jesus. You've heard the name of Jesus is powerful. It's because the Bible says speaking his name brings power. But can I tell you, the Bible also warns about taking his name in vain. There are times that the name of Jesus is rendered useless because we take it in vain. We put his name on something that is not worship at all. That's why you can claim to know Jesus and still be lost. You can say, I believe, and not actually have a relationship with Christ. And there are many people, many, many, the Bible says, who say, Lord, Lord, Christ, Christ, Father, Father, Spirit, Spirit. Many who say, Lord, Lord, and do not know, do not genuinely worship God. We have to recognize who Jesus is. Part of our worship is is just saying, Lord, you are great. Here are the characteristics I know about you to be true. This woman initially recognized a little bit about Jesus in verse 19. In John 4, 19, she says, Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. I recognize who you are. There's something different about you. There's something that that other people don't have that you have. I can recognize that in your life. Her worship begins simply by saying, I know that you can give me an answer that nobody else can give me. I have a question for you that has baffled everyone, but you must know the answer. But she has a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. For her, she recognizes a part of who he is. You're a prophet. But she misses out because to her at this point, he is a a spiritual vending machine. You have an answer and I want it now. So she asks him, our father worshiped on this mountain, yet you Jews say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. 
She was oh so close to knowing who Christ was at this moment. I see something different and special about you. But I want you to meet my own personal need and answer my own personal question. At this point, the woman remains lost. Is it possible that we can recognize something about Jesus without actually recognizing all of who he is? Is it possible that that we can acknowledge Jesus as even someone who forgives sin, but never ask him to forgive our sin and submit our lives to him? Is it possible that we can get a glimpse of Jesus through singing songs and, and reading sporadically through the word of God, but we never fully surrender to him and recognize him as Lord of our lives? True, genuine worship is more than just saying the name of Jesus. It is It is worshiping the person of Jesus. It is knowing what is behind that name. That's why our Mormon and Jehovah's Witness friends are missing out on their Christian walk. Because while they claim Jesus Christ for salvation, they do not claim the Jesus that is in the Word of God. They do not claim the true, genuine, who He is, the Son of God. They do not claim Him to be God. They're missing out because they recognize a part, but they don't recognize the whole. That's why so many Baptists, so many Baptists who who feel secure in their faith because they recognize a part of who Jesus is, miss out on the true, genuine worship that God is calling them to because we're comfortable saying the name of Jesus. Not that long ago, we had a conversation, me and, and someone else here from our church, with a man who, who we asked about his faith. And he could almost preach back to you. Almost. He, he was leaving out a, a few details and some things that were essential to the gospel message. But as soon as they were brought up, he would, he would spit them back out. Yes, that's something I affirm and something I believe and something I hold strong to. And Yes, and I'm doing all these things for God and it's a wonderful wonderful situation. He recognized that Jesus had the ability to save. Without going into too much detail, we found out within 24 hours that this man was not living a life anywhere close to what he was professing and proclaiming. He abused and took advantage of some things that were were very precious to to us that that we shared with him. He he took advantage of a situation and, and, and it was a reminder again that knowing who Jesus is is not the same as recognizing who He is to us. True, genuine worship doesn't just say the name Jesus. It recognizes Him as prophet, priest, and king. It recognizes Him as Lord and Savior. It recognizes Him for all the attributes He has. It tells us that He is greater than we are, and we submit to Him. And with that idea of greatness, worship also then not only knows who Jesus is, but it lifts Him up. It elevates Jesus. Worship elevates Jesus. Don't be very careful. We cannot raise Jesus up any higher than He is. Jesus Christ is on His throne and He is Lord whether we acknowledge Him as Lord or not. There is nothing we can do to make Him more God. He is God. But in our own lives, sometimes we like to push Him aside and compartmentalize Him to being just Lord over a section of our lives or just Lord over, over a little bit. Maybe Jesus can give us help and strength when we're really feeling down, but a lot of times we feel like we can just handle it on our own. Worship is us acknowledging Jesus is greater and I am lesser. That's why Jesus commands a woman in John 4 not just to worship, but to worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit, he says in verse 24. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus is not some dude that we can walk up to and ask something from as if we can get what we want. Jesus is greater than just merely man. God is more than just an individual prophet. God is spirit. Jesus Christ is spirit. Something otherworldly. Something greater than us. Something bigger than us. Someone who knows everything about us and who can take care of everything that we need Him to take care of. Worship is acknowledging, God, I am less and you are greater. I elevate you to a place above and beyond what my mind can even fathom. Lord, I'm asking you to reveal yourself in such a way that blows my mind. 
Worship. Worship says, Jesus Christ, you are greater and I am lesser. And finally, as we think of worship, especially when it relates to our personal lives, worship is again a a very strong action and it communicates Jesus. Worship communicates Jesus. True genuine worship is not sitting and receiving a word. True genuine worship is not even sitting and listening to worship music. True genuine worship is speaking and sharing what God has done for you. This woman goes through a time of progression. She recognizes Jesus a little bit at first, but she's missing it. God reveals himself to her and starts to talk to her about worship and and how he is to be elevated and worship beyond just the name, but who he is. And this woman eventually comes to a conviction that this is God himself. And in John chapter 4, as you read a little further down, she takes this information of salvation and does something with it. Look with me in verses 28 and 29. It says, Then the woman let her water jar, went into town, and told the men, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. She asks a question, Could this be the Messiah? Look at her evolution of believing. Look at her understanding at the beginning when she says, I know you're a prophet. I know you're a good person and a good teacher. To down in verse 29 when she says, this very well could be, and I believe is, the Messiah, the Son of God, who is here to forgive sins and lead our lives. Her recognition just went up a notch here in verse 29. And she doesn't sit back and just receive salvation. It says she goes into town and she tells the men. She could have told the other women, and possibly she did. But it means something that she went and told the men. This is not a woman of good reputation. Not someone that people are going to listen to. Not someone who is is going to be trusted because she's been through many men. But she goes and even tells the people who despise her and who hate her. She goes and she tells the the town people in the middle of the day, this is who Jesus is, and he, I believe, is the Messiah. What we find is that the people, astonishingly, believe her message. And when they hear about Jesus, they go and they invite him to stay in Samaria for two more days. Many start to believe because of her testimony, hear the word of God from Jesus himself, and commit to follow Christ as well. Look down in verse 39. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. Many are believing. Why? Because she communicated that worship. She shared that worship with others. What is the most worshipful thing you can do? Sing a song. We can sing songs together. That is worshipful. As a matter of fact, we have great music here at our church. And I love our time of corporate singing together. It sets the tone of of our hearts preparing to, to go before the Word of God. It enters us into a time of genuine worship. That's not the most worshipful thing you can do. What's the most worshipful thing you can do? Let's study the Bible. Let's open it up and hear a message from His Word. Let's read it for ourselves. Let's ask questions about it. Let's grow in our knowledge and faith. I love preaching the Word of God, and I love our time of preaching. I love personal Bible study because it helps us grow in our knowledge of Christ. It lets us worship through who God is, but that is not the most worshipful thing you can do. The most worshipful thing you can do is share who God is with someone else. Because that is worship in action. It's worship in action. Worship communicates Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about discipleship. Many of you, and I'm very thankful, a handful of you have come to me and said, I want to disciple somebody. And for those of you that have come and shared that with me, I'm so thankful that you're willing to, to disciple someone else. And I've shared with you, if people come to me and say, I need discipleship, I will plug you all together and it will be, it will be a great relationship that you all can build. But can I tell you, for any of you contemplating last week's message and thinking about discipleship, 
Instead of finding someone to disciple, why don't you communicate worship with someone else? Why don't we share our faith and lead someone to Christ? Why, why don't you get out there and, and, and start communicating who God is in your life? And as we begin to share our faith, we'll lead someone to Christ and we'll have to disciple them. The most worshipful thing we can do is share the gospel message with someone else. It's, it's a way of us saying, God, not only do I believe it, not only do I trust it, but I trust it so much that I'm going to do something about it. Our worship oftentimes is relegated to, to corporate worship here on Sunday mornings. And that is essential. As a matter of fact, we can do a whole message on why it's essential that you're plugged into a local church. It's biblical. It's mandated. It's important. But worship is so much more than Sunday morning and Wednesday night. It's so much more than Bible study and singing songs. Worship requires us elevating Christ, making Him greater and making us smaller. Recognizing who He is and what He's done for us. And sharing that with anyone who we come in contact with. This morning when we ask the question, what am I to do? We are to worship. Worship through our songs. Worship through the preaching. Worship through our prayer and Bible study. But please worship through sharing your faith with someone else. Let's close in prayer this morning. Father, I I'm humbled to think that you would allow me to approach your throne because we do acknowledge you as greater than us. Lord, I, I understand that I fall short so many times and I'm not worthy to sing to you, to know you, to proclaim you. And yet, Lord, you use me anyway. This morning, I pray that you would give us a a yearning, a longing, a desire that will only be developed when we put our worship into action. Help us not just to, to say that we know who you are, but to actually act on who we know you are. Lord, for anyone in here this morning, if, if they're feeling like this woman at the well, they know about you, they've recognized you, they've seen you, but they, they've never fully embraced you. Or let their first act of genuine worship be simply submission to ask forgiveness for sins and to commit to let you lead their lives. Lord, this morning, everything we do, we want to elevate you. We want to lift you up. As we reach up in our worship, let it be uh, so that we can, we can acknowledge that you are great. Lord, give us the strength to worship you throughout the week and not just here on Sunday mornings. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.